Hello, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome concert pianist and uh, head of keyboard of the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, Aaron Shore. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Aaron is a fantastic concert pianist, and also he is the head of keyboard at the Royal Conservatory in Scotland. Uh, welcome, Aaron, and thank you for being here. Thank um, you very much for having me. Yes, well, first of all, how are you? It's been a difficult time for many. Yeah, yeah, it's um, been a huge period of adjustment for us at the Conservatoire. Uh, we have uh, almost 90 students, and as soon as the emergency um, overtook um, um, the RCS, we had to reinvent almost the way we work <laughs> in every aspect. The last day, uh, we were actually running our annual piano festival. It was a pretty joyous occasion. We had uh, a fantastic uh, farewell concert for Jonathan Plowright, who was retiring. Uh, so we had, uh, you know, a mass faculty concert. We all joined in. We were playing the Rachmaninoff Second Suite with him in teams, and we were sharing the whole concert together. And um, we even had uh, eight pianists at two pianos as well doing an encore. So it was a really wonderful occasion. We also, at the Conservatoire, we um, collaborate quite closely um, with other art forms. And uh, in particular, we work closely with our ballet department. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were performing that evening. So it was the 13th of March. Uh, we were performing the Hindemith Four Temperaments, which is the first time we've done it at the Conservatoire. It's always been a dream of mine to play uh, that really wonderful piece, but also to have it choreographed. It's something that I watched uh, as a student um, uh, in New York growing up yeah. uh, you know, with, with uh, City Ballet and uh, the original Balanchine uh, choreography. And I always wanted to put this on um, at the RCS. And we finally, we got the players, Aww. we got the string, or string orchestra. It is a really, you know, a, a marvelous but under, underplayed work. Uh, in public, and um, and those are the last notes uh, of our live concert giving. And uh, as soon as the curtain, I mean, they were already disinfecting the seats, and you know, between the performances, uh, we had a feeling of impending, you know, <laughs> serious situation. We had amazingly large audiences for the festival, even to that evening concert when everybody knew that something was about to change. You know, that we were, you know, imminently going into lockdown. And, um, but somehow it was a really joyous and very, very memorable occasion. And then the curtain came down and uh, we all uh, never, you know, went back to the conservatory. We immediately uh, went to our homes. We tried to adopt uh, a new way of teaching, of course, which everybody is trying to cope with around the world uh, using, you know, whatever platforms and uh, online methods. But uh, while they're perfectly set up for speech, um, they're terrible for music teaching. And uh, so we had all sorts of um, experimentation going on for the best part you know, of, of a month. How are we going to do this? How can we do it better? How can we hear our students? You know? And these were crucial times. We had to uh, rethink uh, how we assess our, our students. Um, we were trying to decide, you know, should we try and do it on a conference call and have them play to us? Um, but in the end, we decided that everybody had to submit videos. So they were recording sure. uh, on anything from phones to tablets to computers and anything in between. Many had, uh, you know, poor pianos. They had no pianos. Some, you know, we had to send an emergency shipment of digital pianos to the students who had nothing just so they could have something to touch, you know, and learn, you know, music while they were in um, isolation. The students who escaped uh, and were able to get back home um, before things absolutely uh, came shuttering down uh, are in a better situation because they're home. At least they have their parents and their families and they can have some food and so on. But I think the students who were stuck and remained behind were, you know, finding it difficult. Um, I was talking to one of my colleagues uh, in Edinburgh and he said he's a friend of Stephen Hoff and Stephen Hoff was doing uh, a lot of assessment for Juilliard. Mm -hmm. and he said, you know, they were doing the same as us, you know, they were assessing, you know, examinations on videos, but there were students playing on digital pianos, sitting on their bed, playing, you know, Opus 101, but incredibly well, you know, and so this was a, um, 
you know, an extraordinary situation. Uh, even my piano is suffering with tuning. I think I might seriously consider learning how to tune a piano <laughs> because uh, <laughs> until, until the tuners can come back to work, uh, it's a pretty dire situation for some of us. So, um, okay. so this, but the students were remarkable. They coped um, amazingly well. They were very understanding of the whole situation. Um, you know, I was expecting everything from rebellion or we're not getting our, you know, what we're paid for, <laughs> you know, any kind of, you know, typical yeah, you know, yeah. response if you've been kicked out of your school and everything goes online. I mm -hmm. think, you know, universities perhaps can cope a little bit better. I think the delivery of online um, lectures is, uh, you know, just about uh, manageable, but for music, it's been really tough. So with all the different platforms and, you know, like we're talking today on Zoom and that has some settings that you can readjust uh, the audio, but still it depends on your internet connections and, and, um, and every variable of the equipment that you're using. But we found after a lot of experimentation, um, we were in contact with a colleague in Italy, uh, Roberto Preseda, another very fine uh, Italian concert pianist, He's been struggling with the same situation. He does a lot of online teaching anyway. And uh, he's been working with uh, telecom experts in Italy to come up with a better audio solution to um, uh, these video conferences. The problem is that uh, not enough bandwidth is allocated to audio in these conversations, so, um, which disadvantages music reproduction. And he came up with a system with great, greatly enhances the um, audio bandwidth. So we tested it out um, extensively and so uh, with our faculty members, with our students and so on. And it is a better platform. And I think there's some, there's some potential for it. But the biggest factor out of everything, the platform, the bandwidth, the settings and everything is uh, to use a computer and a good USB microphone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that combination so both ends so the student would have to have that and then the teacher at the other end well even not as critical for the teacher because we're mainly listening um but if the student has this mm -hmm. then um that does make it much more viable as a as a medium to to teach it's not perfect by any means but um and then you know as we discovered that then there's a worldwide shortage of microphones and so we've been trying to uh, to hunt uh, you know enough microphones down to at least you know uh, come to some better working arrangements but we're now looking as uh, for our next term you know in the autumn uh, we've just finished up our assessments uh, our online assessments now and it looks like we will still be continuing to do some distant um, yeah. teaching. Um, it might not yet be safe uh, to be working in small rooms yeah. um, with our students. And um, so we're trying to um, equip our rooms so that uh, they have microphones and good computer oh, really? and fast internet connection so that I might still be at home and my students might be in my teaching room at the conservatory and or they might be across the hallway and I'll be in my room and they'll be in a practice room. Which uh, I must don't... say, Aaron, you have a beautiful home and I'm sure oh. many <laughs> listeners will notice this because I can see some absolutely gorgeous painting behind it and it puts me sort of into a completely different century so uh, yeah. I'm sure everyone will enjoy it. Well, uh, this is, yeah. it's, a, it's a little hint of Glasgow. Um, oh. We uh, we moved up um, from London. We were Londoners for you know for decades, and um, before we moved to Glasgow in 2006, and we had no inkling of what it would be like to to move to Glasgow. I thought it would be you know it could be run down or you know or um, uh, you know uh, kind of not so interesting houses to to live in. But actually, I was totally wrong. Uh, this uh, most, most beautiful, you know, city and uh, with extraordinary, well, well-preserved Victorian uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. So these were houses of, um, of elite industrialists, you know, and, you know, whiskey and yes. shipping magnets and all the kind of industrial. Uh, Glasgow was the second city in the Victorian age. It was, um, Edinburgh is also absolutely stunning city. It was even older, you know, more medieval and, you know, and, and 
and beyond. And so the architecture is different. The high architecture there is uh, for housing is more Georgian, but this is high Victorian. And uh, we were shocked when we came here. Everybody lives like this. <laughs> I, I this, is, this is the key, a key advertising point, I must say, because yeah, I, yeah. I, I think this is a beautiful. And um, I, I'm sure many students or many parents who see this, oh, we, we, we want to. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've been, I've been uh, of course, teaching online now with a lot of our students. And, you know, the ones that are in Glasgow, I'm just amazed at, you know, <laughs> our students are living in really very, very nice apartments yeah. that uh, you could only maybe dream about, you know, having something so nice in, in, in London. This was actually the music room of the house. It's, you know, now been uh, separated into apartments. But um, all of the, well, probably can't see on this camera, but all of the cornicing has, uh, I don't know if I can tip it upwards. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, thank you. Interesting has wow. vi vi violins oh. and clarinets. And so that's it was the music room of this house. So, oh. <laughs> so this oh, was, uh, you know, it was made for us when we, you know, we moved in. It was the first um, place we saw when my, my wife came alone, actually, just on a plane. And she came up and she said, no, it yeah. has to be, you know, this is, this is meant for us. So yeah, it's uh, uh, really you know, a stunning place to live and uh, and visit. So, I don't know if you've been to Glasgow. Have you I visited? have been to Glasgow. Yes, yes, I've been to Glasgow, um, and it's it's beautiful. And actually, I I love I love Scotland. It's such a magical place. Yeah. <laughs> um, may I ask you? So you, of course, um, um, originally uh, grew up in um, the United States. So how was the move um, across the the ocean for you? It was great. I um, I was a uh, born and bred New Yorker. I loved New York. Uh, I didn't ever imagine myself ever living anyplace else. And uh, but that in itself can be insular and um, uh, closed to you know what's actually happening in the world. As great a city as New York is, and uh, so I came to a point. I'd finished uh, my master's degree at the Manhattan School of Music, and. Um, had uh, some friends who already were studying in London that I was quite interested in maybe to have a change. And uh, so I did a postgraduate uh, a degree at uh, the Royal Academy of Music. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, I, I was uh, totally enchanted, you know, with, with London, but Europe as well, mm -hmm. the amazing access to, you know, incredible culture. And, uh, you know, the people that were mixing in London at that time were so fascinating. And, you know, it's, uh, I felt it was uh, something different in the air, culturally, musically. And uh, I felt I had the best of both. I had, you know, fantastic, uh, you know, life and uh, training and experiences in New York. But there was something about Europe that, that um, you know, I eventually felt even more at home. Yeah. Um, may I ask you about, of course, um, the difference in teaching styles for you? You have experienced um, many, I think. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Well, um, I had great teachers in New York. My, my main teacher, of course, was uh, Solomon Mikowski. Um, great, you know, Cuban uh, heritage. And, uh, but uh, he was a, you know, a product of... Um, you know, the of Russian teaching at Juilliard when he was a student. Uh, he studied with uh, Gordnitsky, but, you know, he had all the best of, you know, Rosina Levine and that whole um, uh, school of, of piano playing. So I felt I gained, you know, huge amounts uh, from him because he brought me up when I was a young boy. I think I started, mm -hmm. started with him when I was maybe 11, 11, 12 years old. So we had a very, very long, you know, wonderful, we're still in constant touch. He's, he's now in his 80s, but mm -hmm. going strong. And, uh, you know, he's a constant uh, presence in my life. And uh, so with him, I felt that the training was incredibly robust, solid, uh, you know, very, very particular and careful attention to technical development. And, uh, but also he had a great musical temperament as well. He's Cuban as well as having Russian mm -hmm. Jewish heritage as well. So, um, and, and Polish as well. So we have very similar, you know, um, backgrounds, uh, but it was, it was his uh, incredible drive and uh, kind of you can almost feel this uh, ambition flowing from him to you to, uh, to, to really exacting standards. He was um, great at understanding students as individuals and uh, absolutely drawing the best from each. So his students and now, you know, he's a very, very, you know, well, 
known and well-respected teacher, none of the students sound the same. They're all individual. Mm -hmm. And um, he was able to not, you know, just uh, put us through a, a steamroller and we were all come out, you know, sounding, you know, the same. And um, he was uh, uh, adventurous. Uh, his taste in music was very wide. He was, you know, one of the first to really push and encourage us to, to look at contemporary music. And the, the contemporary scene in New York was really exciting when I was a student. By the time I got to college, um, I, I had the bug and, uh, you know, some of the great uh, experiences I had working with, with people was in contemporary music and working with great composers as well. And that, you know, has continued to this day. It's always a passion of mine. When I moved to, uh, I also had other, you know, great influences in New York. Joseph Seiger um, was another great teacher of mine. He was the accompanist for Misha Elman for mm -hmm. over 16 years. And so he was our chamber music, you know, uh, mentor for, you know, even when I was a junior student in Manhattan School and then right up to seniors. And he was an in, in, inspiration. He was a great, great um, performer and huge amount of concert experience, you know, worldwide, you know, reputation. So he was, uh, again, you know, a huge influence. And others like Andre Watts, you know, we mm -hmm. were privileged to study with him and uh, John Browning as well. So, uh, you know, great, great figures, and I really loved all of my experience there. When I moved to London, um, my main teacher was um, uh, Alex Kelly, who I have nothing but love for, you know, for him still to this day. I mean, it's, uh, um, you know, all of his students have just this incredible bond, you know, with, with, with a great human being. And so there was a difference. There was a difference uh, in approach. It was not um, a kind of um, competition hothouse that you arrived in the class and you were going to be, you know, uh, put through, you know, uh, particular repertoire demands and this. Mm -hmm. He was um, uh, a great person, wonderful pianist, and um, one of the most one of the funniest persons <laughs> you could, I don't know if you've ever known people who have studied with him, but um, to this day, we still laugh about him. His stories are legendary. And he was the kind of teacher that um, he, he, he lived life and shared, you know, such beautiful things with us uh, all the time. It was not about piano playing. In fact, I would often go in and I would start a lesson. I would play something for him and he would say, Oh, it's just a fantastic, beautiful day. Let's, let's go and walk and have a walk in Regent's Park. Is it? Let's go to the pub. Let's, you know, let's talk about this, you know. And Alex, quite famously, he, he wrote um, a, a letter, a handwritten letter, after every lesson. We were, the next day, we would get a, a handwritten letter in the, le uh, in the mail, and his uh, handwriting was famously illegible. <laughs> And so I would lay out his letters on my breakfast table and it would take me like a crossword puzzle about a week, you know, oh I would try to figure out what he said. I would ask my friends, what do you think that word is? <laughs> <laughs> so, and it was not about uh, piano playing. It was often about just life and his observations. And uh, in fact, he actually um, steered away from just piano talk. And, you know, he was much more interested in poetry and literature and, and uh, life and other musicians, you know, dancers and uh, singers. He loved singers and you know, string players. And it was not just, you know, your piano teacher. He was your, you know, kind of life guide and, and uh, colleague. So, um, and when I started at the academy, he was uh, the first head of keyboard. He was just made head of keyboard at that time. And in a sense, you know, almost uh, everything I do in terms of how I would, you know, run the department at um, the conservatoire is a kind of, you know, embracing what he was about. You know, uh, we have several Alex Kelly pupils, you know, yeah. actually teaching at the, at the RCS. Uh, Jonathan Plowright uh, is one of them. And um, um, Scott Mitchell also uh, was another student of Alex Kelly's. And of course, you know, Vanessa Latarche, head of keyboard at RCM, was another, you know, great pupil of uh, Alex. And uh, it was something about his um, generosity of spirit, his, um, his uh, humanity that just spread, you know, this incredible sense of, of um, uh, inspiring, you know, space to work in that, uh, you know, that I cherish to this day. And I, I just, if I could do, you know, a fraction, you know, of the good that he did for us at the Academy, then I, you know, I, I counted as a success.
How do you motivate your students in this difficult time? Yeah, well, it's probably it's a very, very good question because uh, motivation in any period of time is, is always uh, is always uh, is a interesting, you know, a prospect for any teacher. But this time especially has been very, very hard. We. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a magic formula, but the, uh, the first thing is that we're trying to maintain really close contact. We're in constant touch with the students. And so the system that we arrived at that seems to work best is that they upload videos mm -hmm. and then we can mark up scores and then we can return it to them and then have a video um, uh, lesson, but not relying uh, you know, for all of the time. Uh, so that seemed to be uh, quite helpful. The other thing that's been really, really successful, and I think that we might retain it, um, is we've been holding webinars mm -hmm. uh, for the students. So uh, we've been having almost like 100 participants, you know, on a weekly basis. So our international fellow, um, Stephen Osborne, has uh, led several of them. And then our international research fellow, um, Roy Howitt, mm. also led them. And then for the last two webinars we had, they shared uh, the format together. And the... Um, uh, the engagement of the students and the faculty, we were all there, all faculty, all students, was fantastic. And um, in the last uh, webinar that we had, um, we ran it from about 10.30 to 12.30. And when it finished, we do it on Teams, um, and uh, there's a chat function as well. And my phone was buzzing until about 10 p.m. at night. Wow. with people still arguing and putting up scores and annotating and commenting and backwards and forwards. The discussion was so, um, you know, rich okay. yeah. and, and probing. And so, it was, uh, you know, there's a whole question about, uh, you know, uh, the score authenticity and, um, you know, how much liberty the performer has, you know, in terms of, you know, interpreting that and, and, uh, so the lectures have been stunning, and uh, I think I'll retain that because we seem to be able to reach um, a larger number of people at once um, for whatever reason. I know people are locked in, so maybe <laughs> that also contributes to the fact. But I think that's uh, certainly a lot of the students have written to me, you know, individually, and they said how, how uh, interesting they found these webinars. And I think that has been a help to, you know, to maintain some connection as a group um, that, um, uh, that we can actually, you know, have really thought provoking, you know, um, discussions, um, which are fascinating, difficult and provocative. And, uh, we all enjoyed it, you know, hugely. And I think I'll try and retain that. Could you possibly tell us, um, the, the topics you've covered in these webinars? Um, yeah, let's see if I can <laughs> go through it. Uh, they've, they've been wide ranging. Um, well, quite interestingly, uh, Roy Howard, of course, you know, with his expertise in French music, um, was really um, wonderful in setting out, um, let's say, in, in the example of Debussy's music, the um, extreme exactness that Debussy went through, whether it's the proportionality that he found, you know, the golden sections that he found in Debussy's music and the architecture that, you know, that Debussy, you know, built up his scores. Um, two is also to his absolute um, um, intimate knowledge of poetry and poetic forms and how Debussy translated this knowledge into the actual fabric and, uh, and structure of the compositions, which many people uh, actually, you know, Roy was one of the first to actually even point this out. He made these correlations that nobody even realized because Debussy was not writing about it. He didn't trumpet the fact that he was, yeah. you know, that he was using these, um, these forms in, in exactly in that way. And it gave a huge appreciation to the exactitude of, of um, the writing. And then, you know, where's the, um, the boundary of, you know, freedom and, you know, to interpret and to go on while it's been so, you know, uh, exactly structured. Um, Stephen Osborne has been uh, also fascinating in, in looking at, um, again, a similar kind of aspect of uh, interpretation. You know, how far does one, you know, can one go to break, you know, the notational, you know, instructions to achieve a better, you know, whether it's leaving out things or, you know, rearranging, redistributing in hands and so on. This seems to be a kind of, you know, I don't know, a lot of people get very worked up about, you know, can you split 
the opening of Opus 111 or Opus 106, the tempo markings is, and so on. But uh, so the, these are just a kind of a, a little sampling of some of the things. But when you go into it in a lot of detail and, you know, a lot of the kind of historical um, writing that, you know, refutes it or supports it, you know, the arguments are quite, you know, interesting and uh, probably still unresolved. <laughs> so. Oh, that sounds really interesting. I must say, I wish kind of I've, I've been a student uh, at, at the moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll have to invite you to the next oh, uh, yes, season. Oh, yes, please. Would be amazing. <laughs> we have, we've, uh, had, uh, yeah, we've had a lot of guests, you know, who are tuning in. Actually, uh, even some of Roy's uh, lectures online have been attracting people in Australia and U.S. And, you know, it's, uh, yes. it's fascinating. Yeah. No, and I think it's a, it's a great time to open up as the music community because of what I think I find, and it's part of the reason doing this project that um, uh, it's kind of not talked much about the music as well. And um, this also idea is to share experiences and talk actually about the music. Mm. So, um, what have you found um, most um, challenging, let's say? Um, and let's kind of split it into um, online teaching and maybe your personal challenges during this um, period of time. Yeah. Um, online teaching has been uh, mainly to do with audio mm -hmm. and uh, the poor quality. And it's remarkable that the quality is so poor. Mm -hmm. And um, that uh, in itself was the biggest uh, challenge. I think we've helped it a little bit by our discoveries of uh, you know, using external microphones and computers, because even the good phones and the tablets have filters, which I wasn't aware of, that you know, counteract any good you're trying to do. So even if you ex uh, um, hooked up a microphone into a phone, it will not work as well as it does uh, with a computer. Um, not being able to uh, to maybe this five, six percent more of, of high level listening that you need when you're teaching um, worried me. And uh, it was interesting. We, we uh, conducted our exams and um, we didn't have quite the highs, you know, the top, you know, marks that we would normally uh, get um, because, you know, they were playing on, you know, uh, digital pianos, uh, poor, poorly maintained upright pianos, broken strings, out of tune. So we didn't quite, you know, even though we were trying to be very sympathetic, but, you know, mm -hmm. there are limitations to what instruments can, mm -hmm. can do. So I think the, at the other end, what the students were playing on, their, their personal circumstances, was another challenge, you know, because how much could they do? There's a certain, you know, type of repertoire and, you know, virtuosic etudes, uh, coloristic works and impressionistic period and so on that just, you know, we're not um, uh, coming up to the very highest level. So I, I found that hard to, um, to adjust. I felt we can get them up to a certain point, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you know, beyond that, and I was testing my ears and, you know, it was like, did you hear, you know, misreadings or, you know, something, you know, and I, you know, I had to go over and over again just to make sure that, you know, accuracy was, because it was just hard. I just couldn't uh, hear everything. The sound is interrupted and, uh, and it's quite, uh, my colleagues were also commenting that uh, the, the timing gets distorted on online lessons. So you're teaching and it sounds like they're getting faster and yes. something like that. You know, it's, I, I, know. I, say, I, know. <laughs> I have to I apologize. Know. I say, it sounds to me like you're rushing, but just check it because I'm sure maybe you're not rushing, but just, you know, so there seems to be some bizarre. It's very really. strange. It's very strange. I totally agree. Yes. I find it gets tiring to wear headphones for uh, extended periods. It just starts to ache. And uh, so these, these, um, you, you know, should, you aspects, should... You should watch our episode with Mari McLachlan because Mari okay. has found amazing headphones that have, mm -hmm. are not going into the ears, but they're sitting mm -hmm. on the top. And he's swe oh. swearing, he says, this is the best ever purchase. Oh. So, uh, so <laughs> I, I will be in touch about this. But uh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, are, there are, of course, ways, um, and of course, it's very tiring. Mm. Any, any help, you know, we're all trying to talk <laughs> to each other and see how, you know, people are managing. Um, yeah, so I think that that's the main thing, you know, you just can't hear pe people in the same level, in the same, you know, refined way that, uh, that you can when, when you're doing it live. I think personally, well, we're feeling um, for all of our colleagues who are not employed uh, full time, um, uh, the pain of being un unemployed and without, without work. It's just, we're shut off like a light switch. 
and um, I just hope it's not irreparable. You know that um, that, um, and I think concerts are going to be one of the last things to come back uh, to normal. I think that uh, coming into a confined space, uh, sitting very closely, you sure. know, to people is going to be the last thing. I think that uh, you know orchestras and and uh, ensembles and soloists are you know perhaps now experimenting with you know playing alone in a, in a concert hall um, and uh, you know that serves the time up to a certain point but the time when we would gather together as a you know on mass I, I don't know this is uh, and I'm worried that uh, some musicians um, won't be able to retain the and come back to the same amount of work that they had um, previously a lot of the teaching work you know many students okay they've adopted and went online uh, with their teachers but many haven't mm -hmm. many haven't uh, taken this opportunity up to at least have lessons online so I think there's going to be a loss in that way and um, so until the rest of the you know the uh, uh, the economy starts to you know come back and I fear you know a second wave of uh, you know the virus coming back um, we'll have to see. Um, the other thing is that uh, as an institution, the conservator uh, is also in the, you know, uh, facing the prospect that many students won't come back or new students just won't come. They might just defer for a year. Okay, well, we might just be able to manage with a year, you know, like that. But if it goes on any longer, if the disruption is, is worse, you know, I think many universities are, um, you know, potentially vulnerable. Um, and we're a small institution where we, we um, self-validating, so we, we, yeah. we validate our own degrees. We don't have any big brother, you know, support <laughs> behind us. We uh, rely on, uh, you know, the flow of students coming in. And, sure. and, uh, and if that's interrupted, so that's also, you know, another potential challenge that we'll have. Mm -hmm. But um, this, these times often um, uh, provoke uh, creative solutions. So the kind of online seminars, we also have the potential to teach and reach further out than we would have just in our environment of Glasgow or Scotland or the UK. So there is the potential to uh, partner with other conservators and actually have uh, far more interesting networks of uh, cooperation. So perhaps this will be one way that uh, we could benefit from you know, working online. Uh, we can extend webinars and performances, you know, beyond our um, four walls. And so I hope that that will be one of the, you know, beneficial outcomes. That's uh, really exciting. And uh, just uh, really uh, last question uh, for this interview. What would be your advice for uh, younger uh, people or aspiring pianists at this time? The, um, this, the situation that we're in now, um, has a lot of, you know, dangers and, and uh, potential problems, you know, in, in terms of how, you know, the arts actually react to this and how we recover and how we express ourselves. But on the other hand, there's also an opportunity, the solitude and uh, working alone uh, has benefits as well. And I found, you know, that uh, rather than this normally hectic, chaotic, busy life, of running to this and teaching and the meetings and administrating and then you know performances and uh, and and a cycle that goes on and on of travel and adjudicating and assessing and running doing auditions in the Far East and then back in a competition you know this is a pretty you know um, uh, you know almost overly busy you know existence and being forced you know to have this time in front of us. There's also a benefit, you know, I have to say, you know, I can practice much more <laughs> back into, you know, an even better sense of contact of uh, just, you know, learning music for the sheer joy of it. Not that I had to, you know, program it to order, you know, for some, you know, a particular concert or something, but I can just learn from my own, my own joy and my own benefit. So this period, um, 
is is uh, like you know many musicians just used to take the summer off and and you know go to a lake and write music yeah. or, or or practice it's almost you know brings us back to that uh, that point rather than running to a festival and teaching for three hours in the hot sun and you know in siena and then running to this festival in switzerland that you know it's it's um i often wonder why we we you know do that you know we've been teaching a whole year you also need some time to to um compose to think to reflect on the year to recharge to rest and to to practice freely without you know um a particular um a deadline you know uh, approaching so i think for for young people as well uh, just the sheer joy of learning music and and exploring being curious this gives you time to you know to to, to embark on that yeah yeah, well, thank you so much, Aaron. That's That's been really marvelous. And thank you for being so open and sincere. Mm -hmm. I have uh, conducted quite a few interviews and you really stood out um, uh, with your honesty. And thank you for that. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.